In this micro lecture, I'll be talking about metallic and non-metallic resources with the subtitle of From Gold to Fossil Fuels and All That Wasted Energy. Some of this material is from your textbook and others are added from information from the internet. And uh, you're responsible for this material for the quiz on Friday. As I mentioned in class, a um, reality is written on this gentleman's helmet. If you can't grow it, you got to mine it, which includes mining metal, oil, and coal. And utilizing our resources, or the earth resources, has allowed us to become a much uh, more advanced, uh, technologically advanced society. Um, but it also has um, ramifications like environmental degradation and so forth. Um, and that is one of the balances that we have to have in terms of being wise stewards of our natural resources. There are two types of resources. There are metallic, which includes things like gold and copper and silver and um, materials that you've investigated for your cell phone project. And then there are non-metallic resources, such as fossil fuels, limestone, and sand and gravel, which actually happens to be um, one of the largest resources extracted from the earth. I'd like to start by talking about fossil fuels. Fossil fuels um, can be broken up into two broad categories. One of them is petroleum. And the next series of slides show the requirements for formation of petroleum. The first thing you need is a source rock. And these are sedimentary rocks with ingredients for fossil fuel um, production, including a source of carbon, a source of heat, and a source of pressure. So here is a model showing a source rock um, for petroleum. The next category or next requirement is migration. You have to move the evolving petroleum from the reservoir because if it gets too hot in that reservoir area it will degrade uh, and not become useful. So migration occurs, um, can occur along faults or just through the general porosity um, of the sedimentary rocks. The third requirement are reservoirs, and this is a sponge that where fossil fuel collects. It frequently has uh, significant pore space. Here's the reservoir rock, and here's another example down here. Uh, so that the material can start filling those spaces as it moves from the source rock. Note in this part of the diagram that in many petroleum reservoirs, uh, the materials or the liquids separate based on density with water being covered by oil with gas on the top because it has its lowest density. And the final requirement is a trap. You have to stop the petroleum from moving to the surface so that it will collect and become a useful reservoir. And a couple of traps, one, one way to trap it is through faults, along faults and folds here, or having some sort of cap rock which is less permeable. The reservoir material, the petroleum and gas and water can't get through there, therefore it collects. This is a rather blurry model of how petroleum forms. I thought I'd show it to you anyway. Here is a marine setting with lots of carbon um, producing organisms and sedimentary rocks forming on the bottom. Uh, as these organisms die, they fall to the bottom and get buried, and th they heat up and are subjected to the overlying pressure and form in the source area. And then they're trapped, and millions of years later, they are tapped by um, these jetty jacks while they're drilled, and then these jetty jacks are used to pump out the natural gas and petroleum and water. Once we have found the petroleum, and I guess I could have gone a little bit through how we find it, but let's just move right to extraction. We have to go through drilling in order to tap into these underground sources. 
So the old traditional uh, oil derrick just drilled straight down into the reservoir and extracted that. But as the easier uh, sources of petroleum at depth became tapped out and um, diminished, it became necessary to drill much deeper. And now these oil rigs drill tens of thousands of feet down below the Earth's surface and also to drill horizontally into these layers in order to extract the fossil fuels. And perhaps you are familiar with the um, process of fracking. Um, this kind of shows an example of that where fluids are pushed down in through the drill and they migrate out uh, under high pressure and they crack the rock allowing the material to the petroleum and natural gas to escape and then be pumped to the surface. So it's frequently in a horizontal drill hole and these tentacle, tentacles illustrate that fracking process. And then we also have really advanced our technology through these large drill rigs that uh, tap petroleum resources out uh, in the ocean, um, which has its own benefits and hazards. After extraction, the petroleum products are moved to a refining uh, area. And they're actually one of the issues with petroleum these days is there's just not that many refining places. And sometimes our gas spikes is not due to source or the amount of resource, but actually our capacity to refine it. But this is where petroleum is separated into its various useful constituents. So let's talk about the other fossil fuel, and that is coal which is a major player in energy production. And here's the formation process, the model. We have these ancient forests um, that formed in swamped areas. And um, at depth, a material called peat, which is decaying plant material, has formed. Um, over time, with pressure and heat, water is ex expelled uh, due to the overlying pressure. And the heating and pressure process also turns the peat into lignite, which is a low quality coal, and then into uh, a higher quality coal like anthracite, which is used to uh, burn and um, produce energy, which I'll show you in a second. And one of the things to note here is that the energy captured here is essentially sunlight. Okay, so these plants are growing in response to photosynthesis, a process that takes uh, sunlight and gases and turns it into uh, carbon-based compounds, um, a process you're probably familiar with, especially in swamps, and um, then stores the carbon. So when we burn coal, we're essentially burning energy that's been accumulated millions and millions of years ago. And we're also releasing, both with petroleum and coal, carbon that has been stored uh, in the geosphere. So. Um, we are kind of breaking that carbon cycle. And as with uh, petroleum, we need to extract it, and it's extracted in a couple of different ways. Uh, one way is through these very large open pit mines. This is one in West Virginia. They use um, very large front end loaders and big trucks to move the material and, um, and bring it to where it can be used. Uh, there's also underground mines. Okay, here is a uh, mine in, in Kentucky, I believe. And uh, this is a uh, device, if you will, a machine that scrapes at the ceiling. And um, then they come in and pull out these uh, coal and um, bring it for utilization. So the advantage here is that the coal is very clean. Uh, the disadvantage, of course, is uh, working underground can be very dangerous. So how do we use coal? Um, here's an example of a coal generating electrical plant. We have a coal supply here and moving the coal up on a conveyor to where it's crushed into a fine powder and then burned in this very large boiler. Okay, so that boiler uh, takes water and turns it into steam, which is moved into a turbine. And this turbine basically consists of big magnets that when you rotate 
a magnet within another magnetic field, you produce electricity in this generator. It's transferred to a substation and then pushed through lines uh, to feed our need for electricity. Now the water is recycled, it's condensed, um, it's moved back into the boiler, some of it's purified, and we also have a byproduct of ash uh, which is uh, captured and then out of the stack of course um, is water vapor and um, carbon dioxide and other other gases. So a lot of our energy, a lot of our electricity is generated by this process of burning coal. So as I said before, what we're really utilizing is ancient sunlight. We're taking the sunlight that was captured by plants and stored in the geosphere. And now we're releasing it to uh, the Earth system. So we use fossil fuels for a lot of different things. And I'll show you a slide in a second that covers those. 86% of our energy consumption, this is for 2012, I believe, um, is from fossil fuels. As you can see, coal, 23, natural gas, 23, petroleum, 40%, and renewables and nuclear power total to only 14%. So we are very reliant on fossil fuels for our energy consumption. And we'll take a look at that. Uh, nope, not yet. So here's another chart that shows our consumption as compared to other countries. This is fossil fuel usage per capita uh, for the 20 largest populations. Here's the average. Okay, so notice that uh, the United States um, uses a lot of fossil fuels per, uh, per person, per capita, um, almost more than twice for what other countries do. So, so we are a big consumer and therefore a big producer of um, the byproducts of burning fossil fuels, especially when you take into account uh, the number of people uh, in our country. Now there's a lot of talk about China and India um, being big contributors to greenhouse gases, but on average they use a lot less energy when you consider that as per person. Here's another slide from your book that shows production of fossil fuels at the top, daily oil, gas, and coal versus consumption of oil, gas, and coal. These are kind of old figures. Uh, and this one in particular, we've probably over, probably grown quite a bit. Whoops, uh, this one up here, natural gas production because of the increase in fracking. Uh, these values are probably quite a bit higher. Um, but notice up here, we are third in oil production, but by far uh, the largest cons uh, consumer of oil, largest consumer of gas, and second largest consumer of coal. Okay, so this use of fossil fuels comes with a price uh, and um, something that we're having to deal with now and in the future. Okay, so here is a diagram, very interesting diagram about energy use. And I know I'm kind of going on a little bit um, of a digression, um, but I think it's important to look at. This is from a national lab called Lawrence Livermore in California. And it shows the estimated energy use in 2010, which is 98 quads. Now, what's a quad? A quad is a quadrillion BTU, which is a measure of energy. And a quadrillion is one with 15 zeros after it. Okay, so that's a quadrillion right after a trillion. So here's the energy use, solar, nuclear, hydro, wind, geothermal, natural gas, coal, biomass, and petroleum. And notice that petroleum is a big... Um, a big part of our energy consumption, especially for transportation, whereas coal is a big player in energy production with natural gas and the renewables coming in next. Our special interest in this diagram is uh, the, the end result. So energy services, this is what we use, 41 point, I think that's 88, whereas our rejected energy, the energy is not utilized efficiently, is 56. So a lot of the energy that's produced, um, we can't destroy it. What it turns into is energy that is not useful, and then mainly in the way of heat. And um, so a lot of our um, use of energy uh, ends up becoming rejected. That is not useful for doing what we want to do with it. So let's see how things are going to 2012. So notice that we have decreased our energy use in those two years significantly. So um, that is a pretty good thing. So let's look at some deep. So all of these energy sources or uses have increased. Solar, 
hydro, wind, geothermal, these renewables, um, have all increased slightly as, as natural gas because of the increase on the market and biomass. Uh, it hasn't been a huge increase, but at least it's moving in the right direction. Uh, decreases, petroleum has decreased, as has coal, and um, for the first time ever, nuclear. Okay, so this is probably related to our increased efficiency of vehicles. This is related to our more utilization of natural gas. And this is related to the aging of our nuclear, um, our nuclear industry. Well, our rejected energy is very high. Um, so one of the things that we need to think about doing, and a lot of people are thinking about this, is to how to, how to utilize some of this energy that is not being used efficiently. Okay, so let's now go to the metallic minerals or metallic resources, gold, copper, silver, etc. So what do they look like? Well, here is uh, some unique examples. Here is a uh, sample of quartz with gold in it, and here is a very large sample of native copper. Okay, so occasionally what you'll find is you'll find the metals um, present as their natural elements, okay, so that they've somehow formed and accumulated um, and are not part of other minerals. Okay, this is the rare um, occurrence. And here is another nice example. This is a shot from the Smithsonian Natural History Museum of a very large pyrite. So this is probably a couple feet across. So sometimes you get these huge crystals. Uh, this is an iron sulfide pyrite, which we've seen in class. And when we refine them and make them look pretty, this is the Hope Diamond, which is also in the Smithsonian, which is a very large diamond that is um, worth around 200 to $250 million. The Hope Diamond has a, a long, long history going back all the way to the 1600s. Uh, a spectacular example of the beauty that can be produced by geologic processes. Now, more commonly, um, metallic mineral deposits look something like this. This is a piece of quartz. Notice the pore space here, which allows fluid to move through. This is massive quartz that has um, likely has gold in it because it's mined from an area in uh, Nevada where they have found gold, but it's not visible. It's, it's part of the quartz structure. And this gentleman here is holding a piece of ore. Notice that it's kind of a, a earthy color. It's been oxidized and altered by hot waters, which brought in the elements to form um, these gold deposits. And so this is a piece of ore. It's probably pretty heavy too. Um, so it's pretty rare that you find the native elements like we saw on the other slide. Typically mineral deposits look something like these basic rocks. So how do these metallic mineral deposits form? This is a model that shows how one type of metallic mineral deposit in Mexico forms. This is a pluton right here. This is what the surface used to look like, a series of volcanoes and hot springs and so forth. And here is the present surface. Now, there's a lot of detail here, but what, we, what is important is that these are all igneous features. Here's some sedimentary rocks here. And these igneous features associated with the plutonic event um, bring uh, igneous rocks into the sedimentary rocks, including hot fluids. And these hot fluids are uh, transporting the uh, ingredients to make ore deposits, which form along um, these fractured uh, areas associated with these different igneous bodies. So the main point here is that the metallic ore deposits are associated with an igneous event, fracturing, and movement of fluids. So how do we get this stuff out of the ground? Well, here is a very large open pit mine. I believe this one's in Nevada, um, for gold. So one way is just by massive extraction of material that has low concentrations of gold, which are then um, moved to a process that separates the gold from the, the uh, other rock material and refines it. And I'm not going to talk about the refining stuff. Here is another open pit mine. This is the Homestake Mine in North Dakota. This one's a little different because it's in solid bedrock. Um, it's, and what they're mining here is not the whole rock, but they're mining these big fractured areas where fluids have moved and um, brought in gold-bearing uh, material. So 
This is a uh, slightly different type of mine. Gold is also mined underground. This is kind of an old picture. Um, and what this gentleman is doing is, is drilling a hole where they'll place dynamite in. And then they'll um, set off the dynamite to separate the rock from the wall. And then move that rock to being processed. And you'll also find some mineral deposits, especially things like gold and silver, that actually accumulate in gravels at the surface. So the bedrock is eroded. It, um, the gold is separated from, say, like a quartz vein. And then it accumulates in these gravels. And because it's heavier, it settles down onto these gravel beds uh, in the river. And you can go in and pan. This is, this is pretty unusual that you'd find this much gold. Um, many years ago, I worked on a, on a, these are called placer deposits. And uh, I have actually seen where you can find, not maybe this much, but a considerable amount of gold that comes out of these gravels. It's pretty stunning. Okay, so that is the end of this presentation. It's uh, a little longer than I thought it was going to be. Um, so as I said before, we need to use these resources. We need to be good stewards. Uh, this is an example of where our stewardship, I think, worked. Here is the open pit mine that was recovered um, later um, and this just represents that having a, a cycle having a idea that it's a system helps us um, to manage these resources uh, in some places the resources are are um, managed um, but the human cost is uh, is high this is a picture of children in Nigeria who um, are digging in these gold bearing gravels um, to, to make money for their families so there's a lot of balance that needs to go on in terms of how we use these resources. So I hope uh, this you found this interesting. Um, I will be asking some questions on the quiz related to these resources uh, or what's on this slide. And um, let me know if you have any questions. Thank you.